Today we're going to continue in our study of the book of Hosea. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 4, entitled this, Forgetting God. Forgetting God results in disorientation. It's the case for the prosecution. Hosea has written this chapter as if God was presenting a prosecution against the nation of Israel in the very court of God. You can just imagine, hear ye, hear ye. God's court is now in session. The judge then invites the prosecutor to present his case the argument and charges against Israel, and then to present his opening statements. Dr. Boyce says this, The opening indictment in the case has three parts, all of which are sins of omission. God is charging Israel with, number one, having no faithfulness, Number two, having no devotion. And number three, having no devotion of God himself. No faithfulness refers back to the lack of the very characteristic of God that God abundantly shows towards us. Devotion or love means religiosity or piety in the best sense. And it was man who owes God Knowledge is the experiential awakening of God in the love that affects conduct. So he's saying, I'm charging you with no faithfulness. You're not faithful to me even though I've been faithful to you. I'm charging you with you of having no devotion to me. Your devotion goes elsewhere and you've forgotten me. And third, there's no longer any knowledge of God in the community. And he begins to present his case. And this is what Hosea 4 verses 1 through 6 actually say. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all the bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this in the land, the land mourns, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea are all dying. But let no man bring charge. Let no man accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against the priest. You stumble day and night and the prophets stumble with you. So I will restore your mother. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. I also reject you as my priests because you have ignored the law of your God. I will also ignore your children. Wow, the opening statement. The charge is embedded within that opening statement. And then the result that Hosea wants the people to understand the punishment is because you've forgotten me I'm gonna forget you and your children God's chosen people and God's saying because of your lack of faithfulness because of your lack of devotion because of your failure to let me be known in the community I'm gonna cut you off there's going to be a period of time where I'm not going to remember you. When you cry out, I'm not going to listen to you and I'm not going to respond to you. Later on, he'll tell them, eventually you will and then I will, but there's going to be a period of time. So God is really speaking through Hosea to the nation of Israel 
and saying it's not what you're doing that's the problem. Though that's bad enough, and I've talked to you about that already, it's what you're not doing that's really at the root of all of this, and we need to get to that. Or there'll be no healing. Or there'll be no relationship. Or there'll be no witness. When true knowledge is rejected, so many things happen. First, when true knowledge is rejected, there's no faithfulness. Because if you don't know who God is and what God has done and how God has been faithful in the midst of Israel's unfaithfulness, then you're not going to have any faith. The people are not going to be faithful to their relationship with God. The people are not going to be faithful in their relationship to one another. And as Hosea is demonstrating in his relationship with his wife, spouses aren't going to be faithful to one another because, after all, we can do whatever we want to do. If we don't believe that there's an eternal lawgiver, then we make it up as we go. And that's what they were doing. The lack of knowledge of God in the community brings a lack of faithfulness. And when there's no faithfulness, and there's no knowledge of God's faithfulness to them, when there's no knowledge of God's mercy to them, then they don't show mercy either. There'll be a lack of mercy. The people had become brainwashed by their idolatry, and although God had instructed them to be merciful, they were no longer showing mercy. They would talk of, there was talk of love. They talked of loving each other and they talked of loving God. There were feelings of love because they had feelings of love for one another and they had feelings of love for God. But there was no agape love. There was no love that said, no matter what I love, the love that they expressed and the love that they experienced was all conditional. God will only love me if I show him my devotion. But God never really responded. But you know what? The Canaanites have taught us that Baal, res Baal responds when you give Baal sacrifices. So we'll get the response from him. And so it's conditional. So we'll love Baal, but we'll say we still love Yahweh. But we're not going to really do much with him because we haven't seen him doing much for us. So the feelings were there, the thoughts were there, but the actions weren't. They weren't showing love. And they weren't showing mercy. Selfishness was reigning. You know, that's what happens in our lives too. In our relationships with people. When we forget God and we forget his mercy toward us, we may speak of love, we may have feelings of love, but it's not unselfish love. It's all conditional love. Because the only way that you can love unconditionally with agape love is to have that love permeate inside of you because of your relationship with God. Because at the base of it all, let's face it, we're all selfish. We want what we want. And unless we have the knowledge of God and that relationship with him where we're experiencing his agape love, his unconditional love, our selfish love is going to reign. I love you if you act this way. I love you if you give me this. I'll feel love for you if you treat me the way that I want you to treat me, but if you don't, then I won't feel love for you anymore, and eventually I'm just going to say, forget you, and I'm going to find somebody else that I can love. And that's the illustration that God was giving the people through Hosea's relationship with Gomer. We all know who have been any, in any kind of committed relationship that there are times where you may love somebody, but you might not like them in the moment. You might not feel love for them in the moment, but you love them, and the feelings aren't going to take away that love because it's an unselfish love. You know, Nancy and I love each other, and we do anything for each other. But you know... I can really frustrate her with my selfishness. When she'll ask me to do something, I go, oh, or I'll roll my eyes. She, what's that about? You know? Be well, you're interrupting what I'm doing. You know, she knows I'll eventually do whatever she wants me to do, but that's only after I get over my selfishness. <laughs> oh, you interrupted me. You interrupted my time. 
How dare you? You know, I can only imagine what she thinks. Oh man, here we go again. <laughs> I'll just leave him alone. He'll come around. You know, as much as we love each other, as much as we love our children, I can still be very selfish. Oh, you're interrupting my time. You know, we'll give them the shirts off of our backs. We'll go into debt for our kids. We'll do anything for them. But if I'm engrossed in a TV show and one of them calls... It's like, oh man, why are you interrupting my show? And Heather can hear it in my voice even when I'm trying not to do it. She said, you were watching a show, weren't you? I said, yeah. She said, I'll call you back. <laughs> you know, Heather's very perceptive. You know, but we do that because at the core, we're selfish people. Even when we're unselfish in so many ways, we still have a selfish streak in us. And when we forget about God that selfish streak takes over. It isn't just brought up here and there. It permeates everything that we do. And when that begins to happen, and we forget about God, there's no truth. And there's no acknowledgement about God in our relationships with one another, in the way that we live our lives. There was a great deal of religion in Israel. They were sacrificing to all kinds of gods. And they were sacrificing to Yahweh too. In fact, we're going to learn in a little bit that Jeroboam had dedicated two cities to the worship of God so that the Israelites wouldn't have to take a pilgrimage to go back to Israel to the temple for Passover. He gave them two centrally located areas where they could go and have their Passover celebrations and have their Passover sacrifices without having to go to the temple. He thought he was doing his people a favor. He was helping them to forget about God, though. Because if they didn't have to go back to the temple, then what importance was the temple? But the temple is where the Shekinah glory of God resided. So the selfishness that becomes that lack of knowledge of God and there's no truth the truth becomes relative truth is what I say truth is when we don't hold God up as the giver of truth when we forget that he created everything and he told us how to live there's talk of God but there's no relationship with him they always talked about God and they talked about the gods and they had great devotion in their sacrifices but those sacrifices were all selfish. I'm going to sacrifice so I get something. That was the sacrificial system of the day. They only sacrificed with the intent of getting something. I'm going to get a good crop yield. I'm going to get a good livestock yield. I'm going to get a good catch of fish. That's why they sacrificed. It wasn't because they loved God. It was because they wanted something out of Him. There was no obedience when God's truth is arbitrary and we can choose what truth is for us and when we don't have devotion to God and we don't, we don't selflessly give ourselves to God then why do anything for him at all? Why follow his rules? The first consequence of rejecting the knowledge of God is moral depravity. And Hosea says it. There's nothing in your land right now but cursing and lying and murder, and stealing, and adultery. Hosea is saying, break all the bounds of God's truth and direction. Because why listen to him anyhow? We don't know him. We only know about him. We know a lot about him, but we don't know him. And who's he to tell us what to do anyhow? And then Hosea says, bloodshed follows bloodshed. He says, you're even killing each other. Because you have no knowledge of God. You have no relationship with God. And so human life doesn't mean anything to you. The bloodshed follows bloodshed. Each of these sins were breaking the Ten Commandments. All you have to do is go to Exodus and compare these seven sins against the Ten Commandments and you'll find each one of them listed. They weren't even following the Ten Commandments, which were written down, which Moses passed on from generation to generation. Because there was no obedience, God said there's not going to be any blessing. 
And in fact, your environment's going to be destroyed because I'm not going to protect you and I'm not going to bless you. I'm going to let you do what you want to do and you're going to ruin your environment. So by your actions, your environment's going to go to pot. He lifted his protective hand from the environment. He lifted his protective hand against natural disasters. And sometimes God would send the locust or the drought. And sometimes God would just let it do its thing. Because of the curse on the earth, those things would come. The environment was destroyed. All of this was allowed to call people back. What are we doing with our environment today? We're destroying it because we don't see it in a whole as a gift from God. So we've allowed things to happen as society here and society abroad. It's not just our problem. It's the world's problem. If you treat the world like a sewer, eventually that's what it's going to become. And in a lot of places in the world, the streets are the sewer. And you have to walk through it and experience it to see how people just don't care. God says, I'll let you do that. I'm going to clean it up eventually and I'm going to take care of it eventually, but I'll let you stink in the sewer of your environment until you start looking to me. And then I'll work with you. He said, and when there's no knowledge of God, there's no warning from the priests. The priests were acquiescing to the politically correct ideologies. They weren't any longer speaking against the worship of idols. In fact, they were participating in the worship of idols. While they would do their ceremonies and they would do their rituals and do the things that the, only the priests could do in the worship of Yahweh, they added to that the things that they could do by going to the temples of the other gods. As the people went, so did the priests. And God said, so I raised up prophets. But the prophets became corrupt too. Because the prophets started telling people what they wanted to hear. Oh, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. God's not going to judge. God's a God of love. Do what you want to do. Not going to have any consequences. Yeah, God will protect us from invasion. God will protect us from corruption. Because after all, we're God's chosen people. After all, we're a Christian nation. Nothing's going to happen to us. We're the example in the world. God's going to keep us safe and keep us, allowing us to have our way of life. Nobody's going to come in and destroy us. Nobody will have to. We're doing it from within. Verses 7 through 11 really speak to the priest. Like the priest. Like the people, like the priest. The people sway the priest in their thinking. The priest of the day was not doing his duty. He wasn't warning the people of God about the things that they were doing. And therefore God raised up the prophets. And the prophets became corrupt because they liked the accolades of the people when they gave false prophecies and said everything will be okay. The acceptance by the priests sway the prophets. Well, if the priests are doing it this way, then we should follow in their steps. You see that today. You see people in the congregation challenging the authority of the Word of God. And they challenge it so much that the pastoral staff feel threatened. So the pastoral staff in churches begin to accommodate. And as they accommodate, 
they begin to allow things in the worship of God in their local sanctuaries and in their denominations that God has expressly forbidden in his word. And they say, it's okay. God's a God of love. God's inclusive. He's not exclusive. Well, those both true. Both those statements are true, but both those statements are false. God would that all would come into the kingdom. But he won't let those in who don't accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So he wants to be inclusive, but he will exclude. And God says, do this and don't do that. And he wants everybody to follow those rules. But he'll exclude those who don't. Maybe not exclude them from heaven, but exclude them from the closest relationship that they could have with him. The people not only sinned, but they bragged about it. J. Vernon McGee said this, The people not only sinned, but they liked to brag about it. He relates his own story when he was growing up. He says, as a young fellow, I ran with a pretty fast crowd from the bank where I worked. Especially on Monday mornings, we liked to brag about what we had done over the weekend. And the blacker the sin was, the more we enjoyed bragging about it. That's what these people were doing. They set their heart on their iniquity. You know, they didn't just sin. They bragged about their sin. They didn't just do what they wanted to do. They bragged about it and convinced other people it would be okay and there'd be no judgment for it. That doesn't happen today at all. As the people go, so did the priests. And then, in verses 12 through 19, we see that as the people sway the priests and the priests sway the prophets, then the false ways become embraced as the right ways. The people embraced spiritual adultery. And the priests did too. And so they looked to the idols rather than to God. They looked to the stone and wood images rather than to the living spirit of God. They embraced, this embrace resulted in family and national decline into the abyss of serving their lusts rather than serving God. <laughs> Look at our country. What's most important to people? It's getting more toys. <laughs> the lust for more. The lust for more power, the lust for more money, the lust for more sex. You see the degradation all over the place in those three areas. Look at our political scene. The lust for power that's there. And then we find stories later on about all that power bringing corruption and that corruption leading to the lust of the flesh. And what they can get not what they can give. How many politicians are out there for what they can get rather than what they can give to the country? Rather than punish at this point, God's just going to let them be. He's going to let them suffer at their own hand until they wake up and cry out to him. He's saying, Ignorance of the law is no excuse. You're doing your own thing. I'm going to let you do your own thing. And you're going to reap the consequences of doing your own thing. And I think that's what he's doing with our country. A country that has more Bibles per capita. Has the Bible preached over the airwaves both on television and over the radio. By true Bible believing preachers. The Word of God is more available here in this country than any place else in the world. And yet we're becoming as depraved as any other depraved nation in the world. And God's just letting us reap the fruit of our own actions as a country. And he says, well, I'm just going to let that happen for a while. Until they get tired of it. Then they'll cry out to me. We saw that happen 12 years ago when the country got tired because now the country was being attacked. And while the country was being attacked, 
people all over this country were going to prayer meetings. But when the attacks became less frequent, and where there were reports time after time of attacks being thwarted, everybody said, ah, God's taken care of it, we can go back to business. <laughs> they went right back to what they were doing. And churches that saw phenomenal increases in attendance saw phenomenal decreases in attendance over a period of five years. To the point that many churches that saw great growth are right back to where they were before 9-11. Because that's in the nature of man who lives without the knowledge of God. Sin in the natural condition of the unredeemed sin is the natural condition of the unredeemed. And God doesn't condemn people for their sin, but their refusal to follow him. Paul tells us that the law was given to condemn, it, but not to cause us to realize that we cannot please God by, by our own efforts. The law was given not to condemn, but to help us to realize that we can't please God in our own efforts. The law shows us that we're sinners, and it points to a Savior. So the law is not there to bring condemnation, but in the church we often use the law to bring condemnation rather than to point people in the way to everlasting life. Dr. Smith in his commentary states, because of this, these confusions, it's almost impossible for the stubborn people of Israel to change. They behave like a determined, self-willed, and abstinent heifer, not like the gentle lamb that can be easily guided by the shepherd. They are out of control and hopelessly determined to do whatever they want to do. But God's not finished with them yet. That's the good news. Even when we fail, even when we forget God, even when we do our own thing, God's not finished with us because he loves us and he wants us back. In verse 15, God's admonition is to Judah, the southern kingdom, and by extension to us. Though you commit adultery, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Though some of my people are doing it, hopefully all of my people won't. Do not forget Gilgal, and do not go to beth Aven, and do not swear as surely as the Lord lives. Gilgal and beth Aven were the two cities that Jeroboam set up as alternate places of worship for the Israelite nation for the northern kingdom. And God said, and Judah, don't go into that. Problem is, Judah did, in their own way, and God had to bring judgment upon them too. But God wasn't finished with them yet. God was sending out a warning. Sending a warning. Don't be like the northern kingdom. Judah, don't be like the northern kingdom. Don't follow in the paths of idols. Don't forget about me. But they did, because they trusted in themselves. The temple was destroyed. The people were scattered. The nation of Israel will not come together truly as a nation of worshiping, a worshiping nation until God restores all things. They've lost their place in the world, but not in God's heart. <laughs> they still have their place in God's heart, even though now, in modern times, they're vilified. Even today, Jews are vilified. Oh man, look who's got control of all the money. It's the Jews. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, look what, look what the world lets Jews get away with. You know? We're going to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. Yeah, good idea. Let's partner with you. <laughs> you know? but they haven't lost the place in God's heart. God is telling us not to forget about him. God's telling us as individuals, as a congregation, as a nation, to remember him so that we don't follow in the same footsteps of Israel. God will let us follow those steps, and God will let us bring destruction on ourselves, and he won't forget us. He still has a promise for us. But when we forget about God, we lose the purpose for living. And when we lose the purpose for living, we'll go any which way that brings some kind of pleasure and some kind of hope. And God's saying, don't do that. 
But if you've slipped into those patterns, get back to knowing me so that you can redeem the time and so that you can receive the blessings. God wants us to know him and to follow his ways. We can only do this as we are in a relationship with him and know him because we know his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and thank you for the powerful words that Hosea spoke to Israel as they powerfully speak to us and to our nation today. And Lord, may we not forget you. May the knowledge of you and your love for us and your sacrifice for us be ever in front of us. May we ever be mindful of that so that we won't follow in the footsteps of Israel, but we'll follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ our Savior. Grant us that ability. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful week.